Hi, this is Steve King, and welcome to the Ustream chat, the Q&A. And I'm going to move a little closer to the screen now, but just in case you can't read my t-shirt, it says, you can't have manslaughter without laughter. It's a true thing. So let's get going. Oh, let's see. A uh, question from Rick Crawford. For the story 1922, did you do extensive research about that period, and in particular about farmers in the Midwest? Did you pull all that era from info that you'd stolen or <laughs> stored uh, Freudian slip? Uh, I did a little bit, bit of both, Rick. I uh, did some research and uh, when I needed to, and I the original inspiration for the story was Wisconsin Death Trip. And I kept those pictures in mind. And I had done previous research and had made some previous trips through Nebraska. I love it out there in the big empty. So I got some background to start with. And I have a tendency to just uh, then kind of wing it in terms of imagination. Okay? And this one is from Wynn Bailey in Mississippi. I mentioned George Orwell at the end of my book. Um, yeah, there's a little afterward at the end of Full Dark, No Stars. And uh, I mentioned a couple of different books that sort of epitomized what I like when it comes to fiction. Uh, I like stuff that's propulsive. I like stuff that's assaultive. Uh, stuff that attacks the emotions first. Um, it may be that after that, uh, you get to um, the intellectual part of it, but that, that should come afterwards. I think that reading should be a hot experience, and for me, uh, 1984 was, was that kind of experience. I might have mentioned Lord of the Flies, too, but there are a lot of books like that, and they're the ones that I uh, have admired the most. David in Iowa, in Big Driver, a woman takes a shortcut that puts her life in a desperate situation. And uh, he goes on to ask, in my personal life, do I like to travel down strange roads or do you stick to the main highways? No, I'm a main highway guy. I'm a turnpike guy um, and always have been. I like the ways that I know how to get places. When you want to go down strange roads and shortcuts, uh, that's my wife you're talking about. I wrote a story years ago called Mrs. Todd's Shortcut about a woman who was crazy for a shortcut. Um, and that was actually based on my wife, who's always looking for a way that will shave two or three minutes off her trip between point A and point B. Well, a lot of times what happens is uh, she ends up spending more time on the road, but she always has an interesting time. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to do in Big Driver was to play with a lot of the conventions of the horror story. And one of those things is always where the kids either wind up in a deserted summer camp or one of the kids in the, in the minivan will say, hey, this, this way looks 12 miles shorter on the map. And then you know that they're going to meet uh, uh, Jason or Leatherface or somebody of that ilk. Uh, from Kara Wilson, in Fair Extension, why did Streeter never feel the least bit guilty about what he did to his friend? That's very hard to explain other than to say that in my mind a lot of times uh, we have deep-seated envy that we never really express in our daily lives. Um, we have friends where there's an undercurrent of jealousy and I just wanted to bring all those things to the fore. But the major thing about Fair Extension was I'd read my share of Deal with the Devil stories and in the end the person who makes the deal either gets dragged into hell with his heels smoking or else he emerges a sadder and wiser uh, guy. And uh, Okay, so that's fine. The devil and Daniel Webster, Stephen Vincent Benet. But I started to wonder what it would be like if the devil was actually a fair trader and uh, this story was the result. And I thought to myself, well, I want, yeah, and there's also a feeling that I think a lot of us have called, and I'm not sure I can pronounce the word, so don't hold me to it. I think it's called Schadenfreude, uh, and it's the secret rejoicing in the failure of another. And uh, it's probably a nasty emotion, 
but it's one we've all uh, had from time to time. I know I felt that way uh, when the Yankees blew their three games to none lead against the Red Sox in 2004. Uh, it was not just rejoicing uh, that the Red Sox had won. It was rejoicing that the Yankees had not only lost but been humiliated. So I think we have these feelings. And one of the jobs that I have as a writer is to give those emotions that we ordinarily suppress uh, a little walk in the park. Okay, from sneaky twi treats, sn sneaky tweets on Twitter or sneaky treats on Twitter, which story is your favorite? They're all my children. I love all these stories. Um, and there are things about them all that I like. But it's like when you have your kids and somebody says, well, which one of your kids do you love best? Uh, you might have feelings one way or another for this child or that child, but you love them all equally. So I can't answer that question. Mm. George in Athens, Greece loves the title and wants to know what the inspiration was. Um, we had the book, we had the four stories, and there are uh, at least two other books like this that I can think of that have long stories. One is called Different Seasons and one is called Four Past Midnight. And uh, they're, they're orphan stories in a way. They're too long to be short, and they're really too short to be long. Uh, the stories in Full Dark, No Stars, there's no magazine that will publish stories of this length anymore because um, they just don't have the space. Uh, I would say probably 7,500 words is top end, so maybe fair extension might have fit in a magazine, but mostly not. And these are too short to be novels, um, although there are writers who probably publish things that, uh, of about the length of 1922. But to me, it seems a little bit like a cheat. It seems too short to be a novel. So the, the four stories together uh, needed a title, and uh, they asked me for one. And I published a number of books uh, of shorter fiction that have a kind of motif. There's Night Shift. Uh, there's Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Um, there is uh, Just After Sunset. Um, there might be one more. but. I wanted to have some kind of a mm, thing that would go along with that motif of stories to be read after dark. And these stories are so black and uh, so nasty in some ways that it seemed like Full Dark No Stars was the perfect, the perfect title. Tara Parker in Durban, South Africa. Oh, Tara, you're a long way off. In 1922, rats play a strong role in the story. Yes, I've written about rats before in uh, Graveyard Ship. Why rats? Because rats are nasty. Rats are scary. And uh, at least I think that I write about things that scare me the most. And I think w when people ask me, well, what scares you? They expect some sort of big existential answer like death or the idea that there's no afterlife or possibly that there is an afterlife. Uh, but really, the things that scare me are the things that scare most people, I think. Uh, waking up in the night and finding out that your bed is full of spiders, for instance, or uh, uh, reaching up. One of my favorite scenes in 1922 is uh, where Will reaches up onto the top shelf of the closet to get his wife's hat box, and there's a big rat crouched on top of it, and it bites him. And I just thought, ugh, that's awful. It's got to go in the book. <laughs> Marianne in Wichita, Kansas. How are you able to hit the nail on the head so well in identifying female behavior in exigent circumstances as in big driving? Well, I was raised by a single mom, so uh, I had that basis for observation um, for the early years of my life. Uh, I married a woman who has five sisters and they're all strong personalities, so I had that to draw on as well. Uh, and I have assistants who run my life at my office, uh, Marsha and Julie, and they're strong female personalities as well. But really, I think 
that for a writer, the act of, of imagination has to do w with any number of things. And one thing is trying to be able to put on the dress if you're a man and uh, put on the, the pants if you're a woman, uh, speaking metaphorically now. Uh, but I read something in my first year of comics that made a huge impression on me. It was a book by Leslie Fiedler called Love and Death in the American Novel. And uh, Fiedler said, American writers don't understand women. Uh, that uh, uh, Writers from Hemingway to Faulkner, um, right up through uh, Joseph Heller uh, with Catch-22, don't deal well with women. Uh, he said that for most American writers, Sherwood Anderson was another one he mentioned, American male writers, women are either zeros or destroyers. Uh, there's nothing in between. And I thought to myself, well, if I ever make my living doing this, I'm going to try to do better by women than that. So uh, that's been something that I've tried to do in the fiction. Uh, I have characters that are pretty dark who are female. Uh, Annie Wilkes in Misery, for one. But I think that across the board, I've tried to treat women as fairly and as uh, with as much complexity and texture as I possibly could. Uh, let's see. Question from Stacy. Uh, as a Chicopee, Massachusetts native, I was excited when I started reading Big Driver. How did you pick it? I drove through it on my way to an autograph. That's all I can say. And I stopped at a rest area, and there was a woman who had a flat tire. and. Uh, I was. I, I think this is in the afterword to the book. So if you've read the book, excuse me for chewing my cabbage twice. But uh, I uh, was going to ask the lady if she wanted help changing a tire, and uh, there was a truck driver there. He said, "Nah, buddy, don't worry about it. I've got this." So, but that sort of lingered in my mind. And later, when I wrote the story, I thought this is the perfect area. Um, I love Western, Central and Western Massachusetts because when people speak about Massachusetts, they think about Boston or they think about Cape Cod. But there's this huge area of Massachusetts that's kind of wooded and suburban. I love that part of the state. Um, from Wanda in Canada, is there any significance to the photograph on the front of Full Dark No Stars? Well, we had to have a cover, Wanda, and they asked me. Um, if I had any ideas. And so many of the stories are so dark, and at least two of the stories, uh, Big Driver and A Good Marriage, deal with women in terrible circumstances. The image that came to my mind uh, was of a woman with her head down and basically her uh, hands holding her head. So that what I saw in my mind's eye isn't exactly the cover, but it was more like like this. And the art director said, that looks like an Excedrin headache. So we modified it a little bit. But one of the things that I liked about it was that it doesn't look like any of the other covers. I think that the publisher had a little uh, doubt about it initially, but uh, Marsha tells me the feedback on the cover on the whole has been, has been pretty good. So, Kristen, do you feel that Full Dark, No Stars is your definitive work on the theme of confronting the stranger, or do you think there's more to, there's always more to explore? There really is. I think that for most of us, now I'm only inside my own head, so I've got myself to judge by and what I see, uh, what I observe, but my feeling is that most of us, uh, you know, Billy Joel did that song, The Stranger. Uh, I think most of us have other people inside us. Um, good people, bad people, but I think most of us suppress the stranger that either excites us or embarrasses us or frightens us, and those are all fertile fields to be explored, so no, I don't think it's done. I think we're all lots of people. That's not to say that we're schizophrenic, uh, but we are to a degree. The, the brain is a, um, an awesomely complex computer. And it gets up to some weird stuff sometimes, and uh, I like to I like to explore that. Uh, let's see. From Mermaid Blog on Twitter, 
Steve, who are your favorite childhood authors? Well, that I'm not sure if you mean when I was a kid myself or the ones that I read. I think that the good stories have a tendency to to stay around. For me, the first book that I remember, and you guys that are listening to this are going to say, oh yeah, only Steve King would pick that one. There's a Dr. Seuss book called The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins. And the idea of the story was that the king was coming and everybody had to take off their hat for the king. And Bartholomew Cubbins was under some kind of a curse. And I like this about the story, too. That was never explained why it happened, but every time he took off his hat, there was another hat underneath that one, so that he was going to be executed. And as a kid, what I remember is the executioner's hood. And uh, that was very scary, and I just loved that story, and I went back to it time and time again. But I liked the Oz books when I was a kid. Um, for my own children, I used to hate this. Uh, they like these books by Richard Scarry. Do you, do you know who he is? Uh, the, the, these murals, and there wasn't much copy, but there were these huge complex pictures. And the kids would always say, Daddy, what's he doing down there? And You know, I feel like saying, Kid, I don't know what he's doing down there. Why don't you go to bed and shut up for a while? Anyway, so that's, that's what I know. The other thing, of course, I loved all the fairy tales. And the bloodier they were, the better. Uh, Bluebeard, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel, that sort of thing. Um, they were they were big faves. Tommy on Twitter, what made you decide to appear on the Sons of Anarchy? It was real simple. They said they put me on a bike. Loved it. I think that I caught the moderator by surprise because it took a while for the next question to come up. She's gotten used to my prolixity. Margie, do you have any outlets for creativity besides writing? Yeah, I, I play guitar. I don't play very well, but I love it. Uh, I have a couple of uh, fast cars, and I have uh, Harley Davidson 1350, soft tail, and uh, I like that, although I did have an accident a few years ago. I wasn't on my motorcycle. I was just walking. If I'd been on the motorcycle, <laughs> I would have been okay. But uh, since then, it's gotten a little bit hard to operate all the moving parts, but I still get out on the road. I love it. Um, took a motorcycle across Australia a couple of years ago. So I do get out, and I get away from the word processor sometimes. I like my bike, and I like my guitar. Uh, next question from Patricia in Australia, which we were just talking about. So. Over the years of writing, did you intend for a majority of your books to be connected? Uh, you know, w we used to have a saying when we played hearts, if it's laid, it's played. And the way that I look at it, uh, most of these books, I think of these as people that exist in a certain universe. And I, I put this to work in The Dark Tower, where all the things are connected. Um, I don't know if they're really connected for sure or not. But uh, I like the idea of the characters coming back. I like the idea that uh, there is a world out there where maybe Danny Torrance from The Shining and uh, Charlie McGee from Firestarter could get married. I mean, think of the kids. They'd have some totally wonderful children. So, And I lo love the idea of going back and visiting with those people again. I don't very often. Um, because I'm not sure that other than the Dark Tower books, that's something that people would really dig. But yes, I, I guess they are. They are connected. Shauna and Fargo, which story or book was the most fun to write? I'd say Christine, the, uh, the car that uh, runs on its own. I know that it was, it was a hoot when I got the idea. Um, I had an old car. And uh, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the odometer started to run backwards and as it went back, uh, the car repaired itself. And it, I thought it was a hilarious idea. Uh, the story turned out a little more serious, but I did enjoy that book a lot. But you know what? I like most of them. I mostly have a pretty good time. Uh, it's amazing that, that I get paid to do this because I have a blast most of the time. 
Steelhead on Twitter. What story from Full Dark No Stars would you adapt into a movie? I've written a screenplay for A Good Marriage, so that's the one. I think that's that would make a terrific film, and hopefully it will be. And do we have somebody else coming up? I can't sing or dance, and I don't have my guitar. Marsha is handing me, uh, I'm writing in general. Um, what still thrills you when you read a book? This is from Shannon in Joliet, Illinois. Uh, do you analyze them like we did in high school? Or do you just lay back and enjoy the story? Lay back. Mostly just uh, enjoy the story. Um, I saw something uh, just last night uh, from... Uh, the guy who wrote uh, The Hero's Journey. I want to say Joseph Ellis. That's not quite right. But he said, uh, when you sit in one place and you read and the reading is good, you're in a state of low rapture. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. So Mostly I just enjoy. Uh, I don't like to cut them up and see what makes them work. I, I think that's for English teachers and biologists. Um, okay. This is Michael. The authors, you oh well, Michael says, do you feel that short stories are becoming a lost art? To some degree, I do. I think they're harder to sell. I think that uh, it, there, there seems to be an idea, particularly among a lot of short story writers, that uh, the novel is the holy grail. And uh, I'm not sure that's true. I think they, they both, long fiction and short fiction, I understand that for readers, sometimes short fiction can be difficult because uh, there is that sense that uh, once you get involved, you'd like to be involved for a long time. But short stories have their own pleasures, and that's what I learned to write from. And uh, if I were teaching, I would say the one indispensable book of short stories is uh, Will You Please Be Quiet, Please by Raymond Carver. So, that's that's what I think I know. We have a few more minutes. I'm going to do two or three more of these, and then uh, I'll bid you good night. Um, over the years of writing, did you intend for a majority of your... Oh, well, we, we did that one. Did Mr. King, sometimes known to you as Steve, uh, did Mr. King ever want to be anything other than a writer? <clears throat> uh, this is from Jill. She asked if I had a backup career. <laughs> yeah, I had a backup plan. I was going to teach school. Um, I applied for the police in Bangor, Maine, but I had a couple of uh, a minor busts on my on my record, so they wouldn't take me. Um, we won't go into that part of my career, but <clears throat> I've had the usual number of jobs before I uh, became a writer. But uh, teaching seemed like a good thing. I will say that at the time that Carrie broke through and I was able to do this full time, I was thinking about going back and getting a grammar school certificate because uh, the little kids seemed a lot more open to me um, to learning than sometimes when you get kids, particularly boys who are juniors and seniors in high school. Uh, the minority of them are big readers and the majority are kind of like uh, I don't want to do that anymore, which was very depressing for a guy like me. Let me see if I can find one more. Well, here's a simple one. Uh, Deidre writes, is it true that you write eight hours a day? I shoot myself. If I, I write about three hours a day, so there's that. And uh, Eric asks, I was wondering if you might speak to the influence rock music has had on your fiction and on your writing process. I listen to a, a lot of rock and roll uh, when I'm writing and when I'm rewriting. Uh, a lot of metal, a lot of uh, thrash, a lot of punk. But really, I like I like everything. Uh, disco is fine with me. Um, I can hear the sound of people shooting themselves in the head or vomiting when I say that. But it's fine. It's great music to write by. Uh, techno, same way. I like all this stuff. And one of the things that I like about rock that finds its way into my work is incremental repetition, the beat, uh, the simplicity and, and the drive of it. All these things are things that I see relations with in my work. And I think that we've reached the end. I hope that you've had fun. I've had fun. Um, 
and I hope you have a great night. The book is Full Dark, No Stars. It's around uh, e-book, p-book, whichever way you like. So thank you. I hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I'm out of here. You can look at my poster. Thanks a lot. Good night.